This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Lecture Series. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have our speaker, Dr. Kevin Brown. He's a professor here in the Geosciences Research Division. He's been a professor here for, I hate to point this out, but for Kevin, but more than uh, 20 years now. So um, uh, he's been here quite a long time. I, as I was telling Kevin earlier, as I put together just this little blurb, of an introduction, the thing that impressed me most about um, Kevin's research is that not only is it interdisciplinary, and that really is where the action is in science these days, is across the disciplines, but he's also someone who works in several different arenas. He is an experimentalist. He's done experiments on rock mechanics. Uh, he's a theoretician. You're going to hear a little bit about uh, some of his work. He does work on the theory of earthquake physics. And he's also someone who does instrument development. He's developed very sophisticated instrumentation um, that is used on the seafloor to look at gases that um, evolve from the seafloor during um, an active tectonic region. So he's really um, quite uh, the consummate researcher, um, one of many here at Scripps. But um, it's really a great pleasure to have you here, Kevin. And uh, please join me in welcoming him for his talk titled, Shake, Rattle, and Roll, The Physics of Earthquakes. This is going to be a, a collection uh, of uh, material from not just myself, but a whole bunch of my colleagues from all around the world. Because I wanted to give you a, a good opportunity to, to see different types of, of uh, things that people have been doing in earthquake research. So there's going to be part of myself and a, and a lot of things that I've, I've, I've taken from, from many, many of my colleagues. The talk has many parts to it and we're going to be looking at earthquake faults from several different types of aspect and also we'll be of course always getting towards the earthquake destru destruction towards the end of the, uh, the talk because you can't actually give a talk on earthquakes without at least showing some buildings falling over somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, but um, two-thirds of the talk is actually going to be more on, on the general science associated with, with, with earthquakes and how they look in the subsurface and how they propagate and, and some of the actual physics behind them. So this is very basic and I'm sure many of you already know this. Earthquakes tend to occur in a cycle and they tend to have a, a lot of the period is actually um, taken up in the interseismic period where there is actually no particular obvious deformation going on. It's building up elastic strain as the plates move and they're building up energy so that they can actually release it very abruptly during uh, an earthquake. And it's actually the physics of how uh, this sudden release occurs is, is what my own particular interest is. All right. Now, um, I was highly amused by this guy, actually. It made me want to do earthquake physics even more. And um, of course, you know, there, is, there are all sorts of reasons why one should care about earthquakes. And, uh, you know, not least because they can be very, very destructive. We, of course, here have a certain earthquake cycle. We call it a cycle, but it's not necessarily very, very rhythmic. It has often uh, long periods where we have very few earthquakes, and then all of a sudden we have periods where there are a lot of earthquakes. And you may have noticed over the last uh, several months, we've been having quite a lot of earthquakes. Some of these were initiated and are a, uh, a response to the, the uh, El Mayor earthquake around Easter time in, in Mexico. And we're getting the aftershock sequences. But we're also getting a few events triggered on nearby faults because of the stress transfer to the other fault zones which is a little disturbing because this is how earthquake cycles develop and why ultimately we're going to have a big earthquake near here. Now you can go online and you can even 
pick off some of these images offline, but you'll have them on, on, your, uh, on the TV channel anyway. This is an earthquake shape map. So anywhere in red here is a relatively dangerous place to live in the long term. And as you can see, we're in San Diego here, which is fortunately not too red. <laughs> if you're in LA, be a little bit more concerned. <laughs> that isn't to say that we won't have um, some problems here if the, if the major earthquake we're expecting in Southern California does occur, because it is, we will get quite a lot of severe shaking associated with that. But we shouldn't hopefully have the really bad damage. Now, um, as you can see, this is a, a close-up here, and we have, uh, a, these are actually, these red bands are actually strands of active faulting. We have a number of, of uh, fairly uh, dangerous earthquake fault generating faults around here. We have the San Andreas, of course, everybody's heard of that. The San Jacinto, which is a little closer to uh, San Diego, and this, uh, the Elsinore fault zone. Now, as you can see, all of these tend to propagate into LA area directly, which is why they're dangerous for LA. They are a little bit further away from us, which is why the El Moyor, and, uh, if you, you know, that felt like you were shaking a little bit. Imagine something 10 to 20 times worse if it was right near you. So uh, this is gonna be an earthquake si simulation of probably why you don't want to live in LA, really. I mean, um, this is from the Skek website and uh, which is the Southern California Earthquake Center. And uh, you can get, again, th th this is something you can go online even yourself and look at. So this, here we have an initiation of an earthquake, and this is the amplitude of the amount of ex ground acceleration you're gonna get, and, and motion on the fault. And it's assuming it's initiating down in the south of the, of, of, of the main San Andreas strand, strand and propagating towards the north. And as you can see, you will see that there's this tremendous um, amplification reverberation in the LA area, partly associated with the fact that LA is full of sediments, and there's a lot of sediments sitting under LA, and they tend to shake and, 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 and wobble about quite a lot once you energize them with earthquake waves. As you can see, San Diego, if we propagate to the north, will be relatively unscathed. You will still feel it, I assure you. Uh, this is, uh, you can see the actual, um, um, waves as they propagate in and you'll see that over periods of time, this is a minute now coming up to about a minute, you will see that the, the waves just don't leave the basin, they start oscillating backwards and forwards in, in the basin, so the shaking there is going to be very prolonged and very large, which is why it's dangerous. It's not just the amplitude, it's the duration at which the shaking occurs for. Um, so, as you can see, nice and quiet down here, so we should be all right. <laughs> Not so good around here. And this will go all the way through the Ventura Basin as well. So it's, it's nearly the whole conurbation of, of the LA and Ventura areas. Now these are, of course, simulations. These are, you know, have to be ground truth. Unfortunately, you actually have to have the earthquake to ground truth it. So, and you can see they just hang around now. Two minutes. Well, it propagated, for, took a little while to propagate here, but it's gonna continue on for another 30 seconds to another minute longer. So those people just keep feeling it later and later. Yes, they'll just keep shaking and shaking and shaking, yes. Okay, so it'd be very exciting in a, a not a very good sort of way. Okay. How far north will it go? That is one of the big questions of uh, that uh, earth, people studying earthquakes are always wondering about. Will it stop as a small fault uh, or a small earthquake or will it just continue to become a very large earthquake? The, the longer the fault length that goes in one individual event, generally the bigger the earthquake will be and the more damaging it will be. Uh, what magnitude was, would this be? Uh, and I, I answered it would be uh, upper sevens, lower eights, that sort of level. So you can actually go on the Skek website and play with this sort of thing if you want to scare your family and friends who don't know about it. I'd also like to point out that earthquakes are not all bad. They really aren't. Uh, we actually need them. 
We don't want them close to us, but we do need them in general. And that's because they actually are part of the uh, tectonic cycle on the planet, and they're necessary for moving materials around and helping recycling materials on the planet's surface. And without that recycling, there can't be life on Earth. So we, unfortunately, we have to live with them. And everybody must have seen uh, you know, an, an images of plate tectonics with the movement of the oceans, basins down underneath the continents. We have a lot of sediments that end up in the oceans with all sorts of valuable things we need. We actually do need carbon in some quantity. We just don't want too much of it too quickly. We need all sorts of other elements. If we left things not working, all that would end up as sediments in the bottom of the ocean and there would be ultimately no life on Earth. So we need them to actually go down, be recycled in mountain belts and eroded off and come up through volcanoes and all the rest of it. So it's, they're all part of a cycle. Unfortunately, for these things to move around, they have a tendency to generate the earthquakes. And um, it's all part of moving rocks around on the planet. Individual earthquakes may move rocks around by only a few millimeters to up to 30 meters. Uh, if you're near a 30 meter earthquake, that's a bad thing. They are sort of magnitude eights, magnitude nines. Magnitude nines are very bad things. Uh, certainly big earthquakes have bigger slips and total f fault displacement can be hundreds of kilometers. So that means an awful lot of earthquakes during the life cycle of a very big fault zone. They also build mountains and continents. So every time you see a little step in here, there are multiple earthquakes going on just to move that piece of rock around. Here's a little thrust fault. This is just a tiny one. There's a thrust fault there. Here's a little ramp anticline. All these types of things form during earthquakes. Here are larger fault zones. This is now a seismic reflection section. This is now up to a kilometer. That was just a few meters, that particular the other example. So here we have another ramp anticline with a fault coming through. This is somewhere up in the Alps. And this is all full of, this is a big thrust zone. So these are actually bedding planes. And there's a huge thrust zone. This is actually is a thrust zone. It's bent over just due to some complicated geometry inside the mountain belt. You won't build mountain belts without big thrusts and big earthquake faults. This is all part of the cycle of the planet. Earthquakes, this is now a depth profile here. And uh, the most earthquakes tend to be up in the shallower levels, in the top 15 to 20 kilometers or so of the, of, of the crust. It depends a lot on temperature and other types of complicated things. But they tend to be relatively shallow. Um, having said that, there are some subduction ones that can go down to very great depths, hundreds of kilometers. They tend to occur uh, in where we think the crust is strong. Now, what I mean by strong is it's strong as long as nothing happens. And this is one of the earthquake physics things. It's, it's a difference between static strength. Static strength is where you, you literally haven't moved and it's just like you could have a block tipping on an angle. And then once it starts to move, because they move so quickly and so violently, the faults weaken dramatically. So there's a lot of difference between static strength and, and dynamic strength in these materials. They tend to occur in these things called in cohesive gouges and breaches and cataclysites and pseudotaclites. These are all words that geologists use to describe them. And they tend to sort of fade away, and this is another point, bone of contention, how quickly they fade away, into the plastic part of the whole base of the crust here. This is now down 10, 20, or 30 kilometers into things called myelonites and ductile shear zones and blastomyelonites and all sorts of other names. I'm going to show you a few examples of what I mean by these things. Okay, so this is an old figure now, and there are many updated versions. This is the one I could find today because I was actually preparing my talk today. This is a distribution of earthquakes in different parts of the San Andreas with depth. And here is a depth that's 5, 10, 15, 20 kilometers. And this is where the uh, different sections where they have the, uh, their earthquakes. So the bigger the bar, the more earthquakes tend to occur at those depths. And you can see that it, the, the patterns overall are quite complicated in detail, but they tend to start you know, below a few kilometers and go down towards 15 kilometers and have some complicated patterns in, them in between. 
and they are complicated in detail. And this is what we're finding out. The more we study them, the more complicated everything gets. So what do they look like? Well, there are reasons why they're complicated, because even in the field, even when you look at them in the field, like in outcrop, in the scale of tens to hundreds of meters, they're actually quite complicated things to look at. They can have all sorts of anastomosing fault strands in them. They have all sorts of broken up rocks and breccias and gouges, all sorts of complicated things going on in detail. Here is an earthquake fault zone. This is actually in Death Valley. There's some really good ones uh, just around um, Bad Water and some places like that up in the mountains. You can have ho the whole faces of the mountain front is, is one big huge detachment fault. Very, very nice. This is actually the detachment fault itself. These are, are read all shears and all sorts of complicated words. Doesn't really matter. They're co complicated shear zones that develop inside earthquake fault zones. And they help them move and they help move violently. Here are some striations on a fault plane. So this is where it's literally the two rocks have ground together and, sc and, and scraped against each other. Here are other types of fault zones. Here we've had some water involved and you've actually broken it up into a breccia with all sorts of veining and things like that. So in this case, there's a fair amount of water going on in this. Here is a thin section this is 0.2 of, a millimeter, uh, 0.2 of a millimeter in here, so it's quite close up now. You're looking really down a microscope. Looks like a mess, doesn't it? They're not very pretty by and large, I'm afraid, uh, because they're all ground up and destroyed. They're much better when they're not in a fault zone. You know, this could have been a granite or something, but once you've been uh, gone hundreds of kilometers and been ground up for hundreds of kilometers, you don't look good. So these are called cataclasites and breccias. Here's a breccia. Actually, this one's a mineralized breccia. Often these fault zones can have uh, hot water coming up them, depositing minerals such as gold and hematite and, and other types of things. So they're actually, they're all, they're all part of them. Where often you have mines, uh, the mines are, are some of our biggest mines are associated with, with mineralized fault zones. This is a big breccia out in, again, Death Valley in uh, Titus Canyon which is not that easy to get to, but this is a very, very spectacular breccia. Going deeper, we go to the ductile rocks. These are actually a little prettier, you know, if you're a geologist. I, I, you know, if you don't like geology, then nothing looks pretty, but to a geologist, these are prettier than cataclysites. And these are ductile shear zones. Here we have a vein coming through a rock, and this is now a plastic shear zone. This is now not deforming by earthquakes. This is moving like plasticine. It's moving very slowly and steadily and deforming the materials. So strain deep down in the crust tends to be taken up by these slow, steady processes. And um, there's probably some complicated zone in between the brittle crust and the ductile crust where it does everything. You know, a bit of quick stuff, a bit of slow stuff. But this is from the deeper parts. You can now, here in this case, we have actually uh, pebbles. This is an old conglomerate that's been stretched and, and smeared out. Uh, here's another ductile shear zone going through. So ductile rocks tend to have these very plastic looking materials and there's less evidence. There's a nice rotated boulder or actually it's a, uh, an inclusion in a shear zone. You can actually see these tails. So this was actually sheared and rotated inside the shear zones in this plastic material. Uh, in micrograph, you, these are now again a plastically deformed rock here. And you can see these alignments, and here is a biotite that's been sheared top to the left, I would tell my class. Um, and they form these fabrics. And, uh, and, and this is all part of the deformation processes occurring in, in the fault zone. And of course, all these deformation processes, these are at a very small scale, but they link to what's going on on the very largest scale and, and whether or not an earthquake will occur in these types of materials. So how do all earthquakes actually occur? Here is part of the San Andreas Fault here. This is up in the Carrizo Plain. And, um, well, earthquakes, here's the brittle crust, and here's the ductile crust. They tend to initiate at, um, at their uh, hypercenter, they, or uh, sometimes we call them asperities, or it's, a literally, it's literally the trigger point, it's the nucleation zone. And then they start to propagate. So these are different times where the actual deformation front, so there's no slip here, and there's a rupture front here, 
and that rupture front goes at three kilometers a second. Three kilometers a second is pretty quick. And that's what gives you the shock. That's what causes the damage because you're literally for pushing this pressure wave in front of the earthquake and that's what knocks down buildings. The actual slip zone in here, when it's actually slipping, is probably only moving half a meter a second to maybe 10 meters a second, much slower. So the actual movement is slow, but the area that's actually propagating, so the rupture front, the very tip of the earthquake is moving very, very quickly. So this is how earthquakes occur. So this is the thing that gives you the shock, but this is causing all the processes occurring here is causing all, all sorts of weakening. So the fault is actually weakening dramatically in this area here. Now, how big does a fault, uh, uh, an earthquake get? Well, we've been trying to figure this out for quite a while. And what happens is that these things tend to propagate self-similarly. What that means is that if you look at the actual physics, this one kind of propagates pretty similar to its next size, to its next size. So it's not always obvious how big they're going to get. It's not always very obvious. They could, a, a magnitude 4 may stop and remain as a magnitude 4, it may, or it may continue to propagate and become a magnitude 7. And it's, it's always been a problem, and it's, people would love to be able to predict that kind of, of thing in, with earthquakes. Now, one of the problems is that faults tend to have segments. So these are different parts. This is now the San Andreas. It's at an odd angle. There's San Francisco there and Los Angeles there, and San Diego sort of not even on the map here. And this is the San Andreas. And these are segments or boundaries or parts of the fault that are meant to go within individual earthquakes. So one earthquake will tend to take one segment, but sometimes an earthquake will take two segments, or sometimes an earthquake will take three segments. And of course, once they start taking more and more segments, the more dangerous they become. And it's very hard to predict whether they will or not. And uh, this next thing is a simulation for one of my colleagues at Scripps, who has tried, been trying to prop, uh, model what happens when you initiate an earthquake. This is a segment. This is a segment boundary, some kind of resistive zone, and here's the next segment. And he's put it in, in a complicated uh, numerical model to try and simulate what the dynamics of these things are. And what you have here is actually a, uh, looking at the actual cycle. So it'll give you the stress drop as you actually generate each earthquake. This is the time in years. So here we have one event. It stops, starts to load, and then years, a few years later, it triggers the next segment. And you'll see now, you'll see all sorts of complicated dynamics going forth. So another one initiates at this end, goes straight all the way through. Oops, big one. This one, having another go, stops. A few years later, a little bit of the next one occurs. So that's just a small one. That's not so dangerous. Then another one happens. Now there'll be another one shortly, somewhere over here, I think, if I remember rightly. Then another one initiates. Then another one, so these are a whole bunch of maybe magnitude fives, magnitude sixes instead of magnitude sevens. And then another one comes through. And it's this type of problem that um, has, has always troubled geophysicists in terms of, of, of predicting how big things are going to get. We know that there are certain areas that are dangerous. We know roughly that things occur in certain time scales. But, you know, we don't tend to have very narrow error bounds. You know, we won't say it's going to occur tomorrow. We're going to say it's occurring in the next 30 years or the next 10 years, this type of thing. Now, in detail, the actual slip pan, so this is actually how far the fault moved, can also be very complicated. These are now actually from based on real earthquakes where people have tried to take these seismograms, the shaking, and, and then retrace what happened on the fault zone to generate those shaking maps. And you tend to find these very complicated heterogeneous patterns of slip on these earthquakes. So part of the problem is that they're heterogeneous. They are, tend to be quite complicated, and they tend to have very complicated slip distributions. So you can't really easily use all our simple models to predict them. Now, one of the big things that they do do, though, is that when they start to slip, the one thing they have to be able to do is they have to weaken. They ha as you go quicker and quicker, they actually have to get weaker and weaker. If they didn't do that, they would slow down. So if you actually strengthened them as you started to slip them, that would resist motion, and it would actually slow down. 
So what they tend to do, now this is actually friction coefficient, you could call it strength, as you actually have an impulse and you're going from slow to fast, sometimes you have a very sharp initial thing, and then it will decay to a weaker value, and as you slow down it will strengthen. Earthquake faults probably nearly all have to do this kind of thing. They have to have some we slip weakening response to actually uh, do, uh, 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 work. Otherwise they slip aseismically. And of course aseismic earthquakes by their nature don't create earthquakes. So they're actually a good thing, they're just not that common, unfortunately. Now some of the stuff I do is, is I look at these type of slip weakening responses using experimental systems. Here is a block and slider. This is actually a direct shear system. We're actually grinding real rocks in a, in a big machine. In this case, I have a big furnace put around it, and there's a big ram here. And I have one that pulls over here. And we have all sorts of sensors that measure different types of parameters. And we're basically looking at the, how the rocks strengthen and weaken with temperature and normal stress and all sorts of other types of parameters. And I also do some, uh, in my case, uh, some high speed. Uh, this is a new apparatus that we built. This is actually a rotary apparatus that actually spins the rock at up to several meters a second to look extremely high speed processes weakening the rocks. And, um, and you can actually get rocks to melt. So here we are, we're spinning it very, very rapidly and you'll start to see it melting. And the onset of melting is one of the things that certainly causes weakening. This is all dust being ground off. I have a lot of dust in my lab. <laughs> Cleaners don't like me at all. Dust and dead rocks everywhere. So here we go, melting. I've only set the lab fire once. <laughs> my fault, I shouldn't have left some paper near it. But this is actually, when you let it go too far, it actually starts to melt. So this is a formation of pseudotacolites or melted rock. And this is certainly one of the processes that cause, causes weakening in, the, in, in earthquake fault zones. I don't do these tests all that much. It tends to destroy everything, but, uh, but it's always good for a talk. Okay. And this is a type of net result, so it's actually a rotary system, and I've ground and melted a whole bunch of rock off this particular sample here. And these are the types of sizes of things that people can do in the lab. Of course, you always want to have the bigger, the better, and everybody wants a bigger <laughs> machine and better machine, but it costs more and more money, of course, as you go on. So we have to try and go from small scale in the lab up to try and predict uh, to try and predict types of uh, weakening processes that occur on big, very big scales, which is always something that uh, geophysicists and, uh, uh, battle with. Here's some data from that. You can actually see here we have friction coefficient. This is uh, normal rock strength, and all of a sudden at these high speeds you can get these onsets of, of weakening. And actually then I slow it down again and can strengthen it again. And you can do these types of tests to try and look at how these things weaken and strengthen as you go at different speeds and different normal stresses. I won't bore you with all the details, but I, it's enough that I have to bore my colleagues with them. We'll get on to the good stuff. So in natural systems, we certainly do see melted rock. And uh, this is called pseudotacolites, and these are just out by Palm Springs. You can walk out to fault zones in Palm Springs. We can see thousands of pseudotacolites on some of the big shear zones out there. You take one home. <laughs> kind of a long walk, but you know, just take a few small samples. Um, so. All right, so we, this is some, these are t some kinds of things people do to look at the kinds of weakening process and kind of physics of, of, of earthquake fault zones. Now we're going to come a little bit more into the next section, which is, you know, what does it mean to you in terms of the types of things that can happen during earthquakes. And here we have our shake map again with our local earthquake fault zones. And um, we're going to have to take a little look at some of the, some of the fault zones around... Um, different parts of the, of the system. So we're going to look at the Creso plain, we're going to look at the areas out uh, near here, uh, to look at the fault plain, and we're going to look at some of the surface traces and things of local, and some of the local geology around uh, Southern California. Before we get on to looking at our last earthquake, the El Mayor earthquake during Easter, some of the damage associated with that. So again, we've seen this picture. This is up in the Carrizo Plain, one of the most classic um, earthquake faults. You can see how actually individual riverbeds have been displaced. This side has gone to the north. This side has gone to the south. You've actually, it goes quick enough to 
shear and displace river valleys. You can have creeping sections that uh, actually go through fields. All these things are fairly common. Here we have, this guy is not a field geologist. I think he's a geophysicist. A field geologist would never wear a jacket and go out in the field. <laughs> just jeans or shorts, boots. You just destroy them otherwise. So, really. so here is out now uh, near Painted Gorge, which is just on the other side of the Salton Sea. It's very obvious here. A lot of deformed and uh, beautifully deformed rocks around in that area. In cross section, a strike sit fault, in, and this is a small one, just a strand off the side of it. Looks like this is the main strand here. And actually, sections of rock go up and down in the middle of, 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 of slight strike slip. They're not always going sideways. You can actually, like cherry pips, they can pop things up and they can drop things down. So you can form basins along them or mountain ranges. Um, and these are called flower structures. And here is an example of a compressional flower structure forming a ridge. But these things can get up to very great sizes. Um, the, uh, has, ever, has anyone watched the Lord of the Rings? Those mountains, they're formed, at, uh, they're actually in New Zealand, and they're formed in a big uh, transpersonal uh, earthquake fault. And it's actually, that is one of the areas that's going up the quickest in, uh, on the planet. It's going up uh, maybe 10 times quicker than any other, uh, any other area. But we have more local areas. All these mountains, the San Gabriels, all these ridges are all compressional regions around the LA Basin. This is where there's a big bend in here, and it's a big compressional bend, and it's, and it's making the San Gabriels actively go up in the air. And the, uh, they have responses to that. Here is a cross section through the San Gabriels. Uh, this is now got sort of north, El, El Cajon, if you go up on 15. This is Los Angeles. And this is a type of thrust fault that so they see here. And this, this types of thrust faults are what actually generated the Northridge earthquake. Do everybody remember the Northridge earthquake? It formed on these types of transpressional thrust systems. They're actually coming out underneath the Los Angeles and they're buried right now. And we, we never knew they were there until the earthquake occurred. Now, coming back down to uh, near a home, that's just going to finish off the last sequence with some uh, field shots and some other things from the recent Easter earthquake, the one that shook us here not so long ago. And I went down there with some others, and we did some work down there. And I'm just going to show you some of the damage for, uh, that people saw down there. So the Elmore uh, earthquake occurred on this strand here. It's initiated here and actually propagated towards the border and stopped just north of the border. So Mexicali is just there. Uh, Ocotillo is here. Um, and uh, we're actually going to show you some of the damage around here. Now, what's interesting about this is, is there's all our dangerous earthquake strands. You see those? That's here. Uh, the, the San Andreas, the San Jacinto, Elsinore. It's actually loaded all the southern ends of all three strands. So it's this type of thing, you know, is, it, is the next one going to go or not? If you're actually sitting on the earthquake fault, when it goes, it can get very exciting. <laughs> it's an e-ticket ride. Try not to be in a building, stand somewhere flat and enjoy yourself. <laughs> if you're in the building, it could get a little too exciting, admittedly. So this is a video that people showed on TV and other things about some people who they actually were driving down to, to whoop it up somewhere down in Mexico, some students. And they are actually on uh, the, the road, in, uh, just coming down from Mexicali. And the earthquake fault actually goes through these mountains. And the mountains are shaking so violently, they've raised this huge dust plume up into the air. And this could even be seen from satellite images. It was so big. So this is now actually them. They're actually kind of swearing. So I had to take off the sound in this. because They were, they were a little excited. And I didn't want to have to do any bleeps on it, but, but you can imagine it would, it would have been very, very, very um, uh, you know, worrying if you were there. And uh, th these things, these plumes went up for, for kilometers, uh, you know, for hundreds, sorry, hundreds of, uh, many hundreds of meters up in here. This is actually shaking. They're still in the earthquake right now. 
So then it's not just bad, bad camera action, they're actually being shaken around when they're taking it. Yeah, you don't want to hear what they're saying. So if you're very, very close to an earthquake, you can actually have a lot of damage. That's why it's good for us, in, in a way, to have the earthquakes, you know, 100 kilometers away from us. <laughs> it's bad for LA because they go right underneath LA, okay? So this is why LA is expected to have so much more damage than us, because it's, there, it, the energy dissipates very rapidly as you go away from the earthquake fault zone. But it's very intense as, you, as if you're sitting right on it. This is a defamation map. This came from Yuri Falco. Unfortunately, he won't be after giving his talk here. But they're doing satellite images, and this is the actual active, these black lines are the active traces of the earthquake fault. And it's split in multiple different segments. And this is the actual defamation here. These are by fringes. What it's saying, this is the amount of centimeters that they moved. So you can actually see that there's a lot of deformation intensifying towards the fault zone, which is why, of course, it's very dangerous near, right near the fault zone. And then the Earth deformed rather or less elastically away as you go away from it. And you can do all sorts of things like this with satellites now. It's uh, wonderful things to help you actually constrain the dynamics of these and the actual amount of deformation. I'm going to show you some of the, well, I'm going to show you some damage that occurred here on the, on the road and then some of the liquefaction, this whole area liquefied, okay, which became, and you can see it on the satellite images and all sorts of things, and, uh, and there was a lot of damage to the infrastructure and the farming down there. They lost nearly every single one of their main uh, irrigation systems. So there was like nearly half a million people out of unemployed. But they're probably going to be re-employed digging all the ditches again. But it's, you know, it's a really big problem for, for them right now. So uh, we've been feeling a lot of aftershocks. You have the main event, but the earthquakes go on for, for years afterwards. You tend to, this is a number of aftershocks with time, and I haven't given you a scale here, but this could be over years. And you tend to have this sort of exponentially decreasing number of shocks. So we would expect our earthquake background seismicity to drop as we go on through the next uh, months and years. Okay, now this is some of the deformation that they saw on the, um, the main highway, just going south of the border. And you can see there's a tremendous amount of deformation. This is actually the active faults, then it's broken up into all sorts of strands, coming across the, the freeway. You can actually see they're displaced. So this is looking to the west, this is the California microplate going north to Alaska, and we're sitting on the other tectonic plate, and so the actual plate boundary in this area is maybe 20 meters across or so. Here it is in detail. You can see again the displacement of the lines. Here we have the fault scarps going across the landscape. You can see them here. Here we have it cutting across the road. It's actually a little bit of a, a vertical component here. And we're going to start looking at some of the liquefaction. This is down in the south. This is now in the farming areas. And here, what happened was the ground got shaken. It's full of water. Full of full, it's, it's on the actual delta of the um, Colorado River. And they're also irrigating like mad, of course, because it's a, it's a farming area. And it's very saturated. And once you shake saturated uh, sands, they tend to compact, and they tend to pressurize, and then the sand becomes mobile and starts moving around. And if you have a building on it, that's not a good thing because the building will move around. Here we have, these are called sand blows, and you can see that there are all sorts of these, and they're everywhere down there. I had to spend some time down there getting some photos of them because they were particularly be good examples. Here, yeah, and you can just see them going across the fields everywhere, here. All these are just sand erupting out of the ground. It must have been very spectacular to be there during the earthquake, watching suddenly water and sand burst out of the ground all around you. A little worrying, I suspect. Here's another one. These, these are the little areas where you actually erupted from. And uh, here's another one. And they're just everywhere, absolutely everywhere. 
And we, you, when you look on the satellite map, some areas are so overturned, you can understand why they lost all their water pipes. Anything that went through the ground was disrupted because all the ground was moving around, or just shaking and wobbling about. There's a little close-up of one. Here's another one here. You know, people through people's backyards. And of course, there was a lot of damage to a lot of the homes down in these areas. The roads are like roller coasters. You drive on the roads and they're going up. And then I'm sure, you know, I know it's Mexico, but I'm sure they didn't build them like that. <laughs> Here we have a, actually a landslide. This whole, the whole back garden fell off into the river. Here's this house simply just, this is all mud, simply just sank straight into the ground. A ground liquefied. The whole thing sank. Mud flowed in through all the doors and windows and stuff like that. Now, this liquefaction type of thing can be very, very destructive. And it, we are, there are a few areas around San Diego that can suffer this type of thing. Uh, down uh, anywhere where there's sand. So anywhere people have built on sand. So think of the bay. Think of uh, Ocean Beach. Think of you know where everybody's built on the sand, and, and this is probably uh, not a good place to be when when if there is an earthquake. If you're on rock, other than if you're really on the edge of a cliff, that's not a good thing either. No. But you know there are areas where things can really get out of hand, and, and these are some of the best shots. I kind of picked them off the internet because I, they're kind of my fun shots. It's like they built the buildings really really well but they just missed out one minor detail. <laughs> so, you know, you would have survived this, but you would have got very shocked, probably, when, when these things went over. But this is all liquefaction-related type things. So, yes, we have a certain amount... Oh, I wasn't always very... You know, earthquakes really catch you unawares. Is, is, you know, and this, I, I, I never pretend I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to predict them, because I never predicted I'd do this either. But uh, I was actually you know, looking one way and I just drove straight into it. That's you? Yeah, that is me. Yeah, let's see, see that? That's me with a shovel going, hmm, I wonder how long this is going to take me. It only took an hour and a half to dig myself out of this. There are things you can do with shovels and pairs of flip flops and, and car jacks that, that you would not believe. So, just coming back to reiterate, uh, San Diego itself is, is, is not in the worst area. And we have the El Mayor earthquake here, and there are implications for Los Angeles. If we do have a, one of the big strands go off, we will feel it here, however. We won't be getaway scot-free. And um, the best thing to do is, is just to make sure you can try and get away from anything that falls down and make sure your house is bolted to the ground and all those things that people tell you to do. Because, um, as I say, we, it's not like we will get away with, with no damage. Okay, and I, I think I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Yes, so what falls, causes the western movement um, uh, or the western motion, the, bit that in the bending in, in the Los Angeles basin that pushes up the mountains? Uh, it's a complicated question. It's, well, the answer is complicated. Uh, the basin and range, the whole of the western United States extended. So the Death Valley area and going through all the way out to Arizona and to Colorado, that area expanded and actually stretched. And so the whole of the western seaboard went to the, to the west by t many, many tens of kilometers. And the San Andreas was trying to propagate and then it got pushed sideways, it got bent over. So literally it got deformed. The fault itself got deformed by the fact that the whole of the Western United States decided to, to take up and move to the West. It's like everybody moves to the West. <laughs> How does the Rose Canyon fault zone uh, fit into this? The Rose Canyon is our, is our local earthquake fault zone. It's the one that comes up just offshore scripts and goes around, takes a little bit of a bend around Mount Soledad. That's why Mount Soledad's been pushed up in the air. And then it, it travels off down um, uh, I-5, commutes south, 
and then uh, disappears off into San Diego Bay. And there's strands probably that comes under various government buildings around San Diego too. But anyway, we won't talk about those. It's, it's, it is an active fault zone. It has been active in Holocene times. Fortunately for us, it's not anywhere near as active as these ones. Okay, so the risk is considered less, but not zero. If it does go off, it could do a magnitude six or so, and that could, again, be exciting for us if it does do that, okay? But the, 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 the oh, this, and it goes, it goes all the way up the western, the board, all the way up the coast here. So yes, it's not a zero risk. We're not in a zero risk area. But I would be more worried being up here. There is a lot of people who've been working on this. This is not an area I work on myself. Uh, but Yuri Fialko and a bunch of other people have been looking at this using geodetics and satellites and a variety of other techniques to look at how much slip is taken up over time on different parts of the fault zones. And they actually have come up now with, with a fairly good match between the far field rates, which are sort of in areas, so say if you have a point here and a point here, how much are those moving north and south relative to each other? And they've begun to partition them onto individual strands, which is why these strands are considered the most dangerous and, the, and our local strand isn't, because it doesn't seem to be taking up the bulk of the motion between the plates. So people have done this exercise, and that's where these maps come from. Yes, this, this, sums up, this, this amount sums up here. There's a little bit coming up through Death Valley and Owens Valley as well, which we only recently discovered. That this is also active. This whole area wants to tear off and go north to, to, to Seattle. You know, don't we all? It's a bit rainier up there, though. Um, but yes, the, when they've done this local sums, the, 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 the amount of slip across this portion does sort of add up to the amount of slips across all those. I was once asked why geophysicists shouldn't keep chickens on the fault just as if there's animal responses. It's one of these questions. We go through these cycles where we, oh yeah, why, why, what about uh, low, frequency earth, uh, low frequency radio waves? There was an, a, a, a report from, uh, I believe it was the Navy or maybe the submarine service who were using low frequency radio waves to communicate to submarines deep offshore and whatever secret things those guys do. Um, there was meant to have been a, uh, a burst of activity just before, I believe it was a Loma Prieta earthquake. I actually don't know. It doesn't seem to have got much, uh, we don't seem to have seen any more. So uh, it's, uh, maybe it was just a one-off thing. It, it, it's a relatively big one. Uh, the Alaska earthquake, 64, was a nine. It's a nine. It was a nine. It's, it's, it, there's, there's a Sumatra earthquake, the Chile earthquake, and the Alaska one. They're the three big ones in the last 150 years. Magnitude nines are in, they're the three big ones in the last uh, 100. The ones I mentioned? Yes. Uh, no, no, the North, North Ridge. North Ridge is oh, not a very big one. Sumatra. So they probably released between them 80% of all the earthquake energy that's been released in the last 150 years. That's what a magnitude nine is. They're big. So, so we're lucky we don't have magnitude nines. Magnitude sevens are big, but magnitude nines are very impressive. <laughs> In a complicated way, yes, because uh, you tend to, that doesn't mean to say that there are, uh, uh, as, as, as earthquake, as you have a half to shock sequence, does the actual intensity also decrease as well as the number of them? And the answer is yes, generally so. But that doesn't mean there aren't always a few big ones every now and then that can't occur even quite late. So a magnitude, well, the size of a magnitude four is a kiloton of TNT. Yes, for every magnitude, every magnitude is a, is a magnitude. Every time you have an order of magnitude, it's 30 times stronger, 30 times more energy released. So you can do the math. So the Mexico earthquake just stopped just south of where all the other ones started. And uh, the, uh, the question was how predictable is it that it's going to trigger something on one of the others? Uh, the answer is it will help trigger something on one of the others. The time, the trouble for us is, is when. Those earthquake faults will go active and probably within the next decade or so, within our lifetimes, we, it, we, there's every good chance that one of those will have quite a, a very large earthquake.